Last time we were talking about the rise of Hitler, and we discussed his early moves. Within a few months, he had managed to eliminate all opposition parties, all of them were outlawed. He started by banning the Communist Party. They were, remember, the people who actually put him into power by forming an alliance so that the two of them together had a majority in the Reichstag. Then he got the socialists in the Reichstag to support him, and then turned around and got the Reichstag actually to back the Enabling Act, which meant that he and his cabinet had complete, total power. They were capable of creating legislation. Keep in mind that in a system of government like ours, the idea is supposed to be that the legislature actually passes laws, the executive signs them, and or may veto them, but then has charge of enforcing them. And the judicial branch makes judgments under that enforcement. Well, basically, what Hitler managed to do is collapse all of those into himself and a small select group of people. All the legislative authority got transferred to the executive power. And so Hitler really had absolute control within just a few months. He backed that up by creating three different security systems. See, three real police forces, I suppose you could say, in addition to the German army, that served to be a kind of enforcement mechanism for the will of the Fuhrer which is what he called himself, the leader. There were three of these. Historians have called this a kind of institutionalized Darwinism. They competed against each other for Hitler's allegiance, and so there was a kind of natural survival of the fittest type of thing. There were three of these groups, the SA, the brown shirts, the SS, the black shirts, and then the Gestapo, which were really a subset of the SS. So first of all, the SA. They were the brown shirts, a typical uniform is pictured there. They were run by uh, room. Over a hundred million people were in this organization by the fall of 1933. Remember, he took power in March of 1933, so this is not very long. Um, there were three and a half million in reserve. Well, I said March. Really, officially by the end of January, January 30th. Now, they practiced brutal open street violence. Okay, anybody who was suspected of opposing the Nazi party, they would simply beat up, stab, etc. They became so powerful that Hitler began to feel threatened by Röhm and his troops. <laughs> After all, you've got three and a half million people, in addition to the one million who are actually active in this group. This is a huge internal army. And so Hitler started thinking that a number of people connected with this were becoming too powerful, and that he had to seize control. So on July 2nd, 1934, what is called the Night of the Long Knives, he had Röhm, Strasser, and other political opponents shot. Between five and 7,000 people were simply assassinated in their beds at night, all of them at one night. Okay? So he took control personally then of the SA. This was what convinced Stalin you didn't have to play all these complex mind games. <laughs> Just have your opponents shot. Okay? Notice Hitler didn't bother trying to set Strasser against Rome or vice versa and all of that. He didn't take years to deal with these people. One night, boom, they were gone. Okay, five to seven thousand dead. The SS was the second and much more elite group. Heinrich Himmler was in charge of the SS, the black shirts. They were a highly trained elite. Their uniforms are pictured here. They're much more military in style. There were 52,000 of these in 1933, as opposed to the one million in the SA. So this was a much more tightly controlled group. Really, people got into this by either excelling in the military or excelling in the police or that type of thing. So it was a difficult group to join. And then there was a small subset of that, which was really Hitler's personal security guards. They were the Gestapo. Uh, here they are running through the streets with dogs in pursuit of a suspect. The Gestapo were the most feared. The SA might beat you up. The SS, if they capture you, are going to interrogate you and you're going to be in real trouble. But if the Gestapo seizes you, then it's over. <laughs> okay, the Gestapo were the, mo the most serious of these groups by far. In March 1933, so just after he had taken power, Hitler had already established a concentration camp. The very first one opened at Dachau for 5,000 prisoners, all of whom were charged rather vaguely with suspicion of activities inimical to the state. These camps were, at this point, not death camps. They were places where his political opponents went. Um, but they were incredibly harsh. People could be flogged or put to death for doing things like holding meetings, <laughs> making speeches, forming cliques, loitering, or collecting any information about the camps. So essentially, if you were in one of those camps and caught talking to people or caught, caught writing anything down, 
you would be executed. Let's turn to Churchill's book, The Gathering Storm. In it, he describes how a condition of, you might say, <laughs> the countries of the world recognizing the horrors of war and striving for peace at the end of World War I turned into World War II. And so here is his model, how the English-speaking peoples, through their unwisdom, carelessness, and good nature, allowed the wicked to rearm. Notice, through their unwisdom, so he's making a moral criticism here, carelessness, yes, but also good nature. People wanted to believe, they wanted to cooperate, they wanted to believe that other people were like they were in seeking peace, in trying to advance their interests, but doing so peacefully. And so he's saying, look, in part, they were really careless. In part, they were unwise. They let Hitler have all sorts of advantages they should not have permitted him. But on the other hand, they did it partly because they were good-natured people. They wanted peace. They assumed that people on the other side were also seeking peace, seeking justice. And that was a very serious mistake. Here is this, a picture of this in the eyes of the Nazis. This is Goebbels giving a briefing in April 1940, explaining his amazement, basically, at what had happened during the 1930s. W. H. Auden, the poet, referred to the 1930s as a low, dishonest decade. And indeed, in this sort of history that we're about to review, it was. Here is Goebbels' briefing. Up to now, should I do this in a German accent? Yes. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Up to now, we have succeeded in leaving the enemy in the dark concerning Germany's real goals. Just as before 1932, our domestic foes never saw where we were going, or that our oath of legality was just a trick. We wanted to come to power legally, but we did not want to use power legally. Okay, so he's seeking to come to power through ordinary democratic means, through political co coalitions and so on, but the moment they have power, law goes out the window. They could have suppressed us. They could have arrested a couple of us in 1925, and that would have been that. The end. No, they let us through the danger zone. That's exactly how it was in foreign policy, too. In 1933, a French premier ought to have said, and if I had been the French premier, I would have said it. The new Reich Chancellor is the man who wrote Mein Kampf, which says this and that. This man cannot be tolerated in our vicinity. Either he disappears or we march. But they didn't do it. They left us alone and let us slip through the risky zone, and we were able to sand around all, sail around all dangerous reefs. And when we were done and well armed, better than they, then they started the war. Okay. Now, Goebbels is absolutely astounded. Hitler, as we'll see throughout the 30s, pulls off bluff after bluff. Amazing trick after trick, basically. All of his generals are saying, look, this is insane. This is crazy. Don't do this. You're going to get us into deep trouble. We don't have the strength. They're going to attack. We're, it'll be over. And Hitler keeps saying to them, essentially, chill out. It'll be all right. Okay? Uh, and he turns out to be right time after time. And here is Goebbels, one of his chief lieutenants, just expressing amazement at that. What on earth were the Allies thinking? Why did they not do something when it would have been incredibly easy to do? Well, that's what we're going to investigate. Here was Hitler's plan. To gain control of Germany, to destroy the Versailles Treaty, to make Germany the chief power of Central Europe. And as you can see, by 1933, he had number one checked off. <laughs> Destroy the Versailles Treaty. Well, we're going to see that throughout the 30s, he does that step by step. Make Germany the chief power of Central Europe. Yes, step by step. Then, destroy the Soviet Union. After that, establish a continental empire. Basically, have Germany in control all the way from Portugal up to Siberia. And then, finally, he thought, long after his death, Germany would have to fight the United States for world domination. So his thought is that all of these steps can be done in the 1930s. This is a task for the 1940s. And then this, he thought, will really have to wait um, until some point he kind of vaguely hints around the year 2000. There will be another great war between Germany and the United States. Of course, things didn't quite go as planned. <laughs> this one got moved up, and that caused serious trouble for him. In any event, let's go back to the conditions in the late 20s. Before Hitler has seized power, the countries of Western Europe are trying to eliminate the possibility of another world war. And so people gather to negotiate what becomes known as the Kellogg-Briand Pact. And here is Solomon's picture of, of the negotiators there. As you can see, they're amused by his small camera, saying, look, he's taking a picture of us. <laughs> well, here is what the pact said. It was a pact to outlaw war. The high contracting parties solemnly declare in the names of their respective peoples 
that they condemn recourse to war for the solution of international controversies and renounce it as an instrument of national policy in their relations with one another. Okay, so they all promise not to fight, not to go to war. They utterly renounce war as the solution of any international controversy. Article 2, the high contracting parties agree that the settlement or solution of all disputes or conflicts of whatever nature or of whatever origin they may be, which may arise among them, shall never be sought except by specific means. So they're all promising never to fight one another, in general to renounce war, and in particular to seek methods of conflict resolution that don't involve armed conflict, that don't involve force. So they're going to do nothing but negotiate, appeal to the League of Nations, things like that. Now, well, yes. <laughs> you find out. The nations of the world have just come together, not all of them, but many of them, have come together and agreed to outlaw war. They've agreed they will not fight wars. Is this a great accomplishment or what? Well, all right, first point is it didn't work. Look what happens, actually. <laughs> In 1931, Japan invaded Manchuria. Um, in 1935, Italy invaded Ethiopia. Germany seized the Rhineland and then Austria and then Czechoslovakia in the years 1936 through 39. That's supposed to be 1939. But it's formed, yeah, but there is an advantage to this. Okay, so it didn't work. In fact, all of the people said, oh yeah, we'll never fight, we will not. We renounce conflict, we will not use force of arms. The moment it becomes convenient, turn around and do it. But on the other hand, it did something that I think has a kind of lasting importance. It established a legal framework according to which war criminals could actually be prosecuted, for example. It established a certain set of expectations. It was really the basis on which the Nuremberg trials, for example, were held. That and together with some German laws that Hitler didn't bother to uh, overturn, he simply ignored them. But it was a way of then finding those who were guilty of aggression and war crimes guilty, um, it also set a certain kind of standard. That is to say, it said, this is all unacceptable. And it helped to mobilize world opinion so that when those examples of aggression occurred, people were horrified and denounced them. Now, on the one hand, that didn't do people in Manchuria or Ethiopia much good, <laughs> right? The world disapproved. Well, hmm, a lot of good that is. On the other hand, that was something. At least there was a declaration here that warfare wasn't just part of the normal course of events. Warfare was not just politics by other means. As Clausewitz had said, no, warfare was something that was morally illegitimate and problematic. Now, let's go back to 1933. We've seen that this pact was supposed to eliminate war, but by 1933 there were, also, there were several examples where it had failed. MacDonald. Prime Minister of Great Britain, puts, and really the, uh, the first Prime Minister who was not of the ruling classes, really the first working class Prime Minister, Labour Prime Minister, he puts forward the McDonald plan. What it would do is reduce the French army from 500,000 to 200,000. It would allow the Germans to increase the size of their army to 200,000. So in other words, what he was saying is France will shrink its army and Germany will be allowed to increase it so that France and Germany now are just as powerful as each other. The Germans already had reserves of over one million, which the French did not, so actually that equality was somewhat bogus. It restricted new guns to just 4.2 inches, and it reduced air forces to 500 planes. So it basically said there will be a limit on the power of artillery and naval guns, there will be a limit to air forces, and we'll all have the same size army. How about that? Now, you are, let's say, a politician in France, or a politician in Britain. And MacDonald puts forward this plan. I've got an idea. Let's forget about the Versailles Treaty and its vast restrictions on the German military. We'll allow Germany to be as powerful as France or as the United Kingdom. Do you vote yes or no? OK, you vote no. Now, it's very easy in retrospect, right? <laughs> What's really remarkable about this is that Hitler himself voted no. Churchill said this was like being <laughs> smothered by a feather bed. Uh, but in any case, Hitler rejected this outright. He said, basically, he said, no, nein. <laughs> Germany seeks military superiority, not equality. We don't want any part of this. He withdrew from the Disarmament Conference and the League of Nations and basically made it clear he was not about to cooperate. 
Well, that wasn't the reaction that McDonald or anyone else in Britain really expect, expected. <coughs> but what was the response? You might think the response would have been to say, wait a minute, we've tried to cooperate with this Hitler guy and give him equality, set up something fairer than the outcome of the Treaty of Versailles, and he's rejected it. That's a bad sign, right? We better be on our guard. But in fact, the reaction was the opposite. I want to remind you of E.M. Forster in the Bloomsbury Group who said, I hate the idea of causes. If I had to choose between betraying my country and betraying my friend, I hope I should have the guts to betray my country. That reveals a kind of attitude that's partly a philosophical attitude about the very foundational sources of value in personal relationships, but it's partly indicating that patriotism is at a very high consideration, right? Look, I'm willing, but my friend has defected. <laughs> my friend is a spy. Oh, well, then I'll betray my country rather than betray my friend. And it indicates a set of attitudes that really leads to a general pacifism. That's sort of attitude about patriotism turns into pacifism, which then later, sort of in the, the students of this group, becomes loyalty to Stalin and even Soviet espionage. Let's take a look at some prominent examples of this pacifist attitude that became really dominant in Britain during the 1930s. Here is George Lansbury, a Labour Party leader, pictured there in June of 1933, so just a few months after Hitler has come to power. I would close every recruiting station. Disband the army and the disarm the air force. I'm going to abolish the whole dreadful equipment of war and say to the world, do your worst. Okay, well. <laughs> he didn't last that long as a Labour Party leader, but Clement Attlee, who replaced him, said, we are unalterably opposed to anything in the nature of rearmament. Okay, so basically the Labour Party and its leaders are saying, we favor disarmament, unilateral disarmament. Here's the way to keep the peace, give up the weapons of war. Now, suppose you do that. Suppose you say, we're going to disarm. And indeed, people throughout up at various points in history have argued for that. So suppose the United States today just said, let's disband the military, disband the Air Force, say to the world, do your worst. I mean, <laughs> presumably we wouldn't, we wouldn't say it with that accent. But suppose we said that, right? What would be the result be? Yeah. Well, people like Kipling would get kind of um, scared and frustrated. Ah, yes, if you think back to Kipling and his attitudes, you know, <laughs> it's a jungle out there, right? So this is something like the tiger going belly up and saying, I won't use my claws. In fact, I've gone over to some concrete, and I have scratched them off. And I will purposely keep my mouth closed. Do your worst. <laughs> What happens in the jungle to an animal that does? <laughs> yeah, it dies, okay? Nothing good. <laughs> and so to the if from the point of view of somebody like Kipling or somebody like Winston Churchill, this is absolutely insane. How do you keep yourself and your people safe? By being well-armed, basically, by being able to protect yourself. If you purposely weaken yourself, especially with people like Hitler in the neighborhood who have already shown themselves unwilling to cooperate with you, you're in real danger. Nevertheless, Churchill was a voice crying in the wilderness throughout all this period. He was out of power. He was immensely unpopular. When he said, look, this is insane, people laughed at him. They mocked at him. The dominant attitude was actually that of Lansbury and Attlee. They were the ones who seemed to be enlightened opinion. We've seen where war gets us. What we must do is renounce war, renounce all of the weapons of war. That will lead the world to be a safer place. Well, that's the argument. Now, Hitler, meanwhile, was making speeches. Actually, my grandfather had a shortwave radio and used to listen to Hitler's speeches, even though he didn't know German. <laughs> my grandfather was a very strange man. Um, <laughs> this was not my German grandfather. This was the Serbian grandfather. But he just said, look, the reason he didn't is that the excitement of the speeches was so tremendous. And he, it's not that he was a Nazi. It was just a, a phenomenon. I mean, Hitler would be screaming to these huge crowds, hundreds of thousands of people. You know, on this type of thing, okay? <laughs> they would go on and on. They were like tremendous rallies. Hitler was in part inspired by Wagner and this idea of a grand opera. He was interested in the arts and theater. And they were huge theatrical productions, very impressive theatrical productions. So, and he would say all sorts of aggressive things. Germany must become the leading power of Europe. The German people must expand. They need space to live. Our country must expand. And what did the Times of London say about this? No, oh, this is mere rhetoric intended for home consumption, simply to restore German pride. We needn't worry about it. The Oxford Union in 1933 debated the question 
but this House refuses in any circumstances to fight for king and country. The debate occurred and it passed by a margin of about three to one. Hitler himself was really struck by that one. For one thing, these Oxford Union debates were a very big deal. Um, for another, this wasn't just a bunch of students gathering in a small room. I mean, in a way it was, but, <laughs> but nevertheless, there was huge press attention given to this. And it was quite striking that at Oxford University, three-fourths of the student body essentially said, I will not fight for king and country under any circumstances. <laughs> Hitler basically said, look, we can do anything we want. The French, the British will do nothing to counteract us. And he turned out to be right for a very long time. In 1934, early in the year, Britain, France, and Italy gave their support to Austrian independence. One of the things Hitler was saying in these speeches is that all the people who spoke German and were ethnically German should be united in a greater Germany. Well, where were the people who were speaking German and were ethnically German? All over the world, but in large concentrations, well, Austria, right next to it. So he started implying that Austria really should properly be understood as part of Germany. So Britain, France, and Italy hearing this, even though some opinions are saying, oh, ignore it, it's just for home consumption, nevertheless, they declared, look, we're going to protect Austrian independence. The very next month, Italy, Hungary, and Austria together signed the Rome Protocols that pledged basically to preserve Austrian independence. Italy was promising to come to Austria and Hungary's <laughs> Uh, defense if anything should happen. Mussolini and June met Hitler in Venice, and they were not yet buddies. His reaction to Hitler was this, non mi piace, okay? I don't like him, he doesn't please me. A garrulous monk, okay? That's what he thought of Hitler. Garrulous, what does that mean? Talkative. Talkative, yeah. He's a monk who won't shut up, basically. So Mussolini had no use for him. So notice here, Britain, France, and Italy, together with Austria and Hungary, were all on the same side. Well, July 2nd, that was the night of the long knives. That was where Hitler killed five to 7,000 of his opponents, took full control of the SA, and was undisputed master of all three of those security systems. Later that same month, German agents assassinated the Austrian Chancellor, Dolphus. Dolphus was himself a fascist, by the way. He was a close ally of Mussolini, and in fact, when he was assassinated, his wife and children were staying at Mussolini's villa. Mussolini was the one who informed his wife and children that he had been murdered. Okay, so Mussolini was outraged at this. It seemed a very direct assault. It was obvious that it was German agents who were behind it. And so you might have thought, given what had been happening, this would already lead to war. That Italy, that Hungary, perhaps Britain and France as well, would say this is unacceptable. But shortly thereafter, there was a clash between Italian and Ethiopian soldiers at Wal Wal on the borders of Ethiopia and S Somalia, essentially, what was then called Somaliland. Now, who was at fault in this border clash is unclear. Um, the facts are vague. Uh, but in any event, <laughs> Paul Johnson has said, it's at the essence of geopolitics to be able to distinguish between different degrees of evil. What does he mean? Well, Mussolini was furious over this border clash and promised to invade Ethiopia. <clears throat> the rest of Europe was astounded by this. This seemed like a minor border skirmish, more an excuse to go to war. In fact, most people thought the Italians must have started it. Otherwise, why this gross overreaction? But in any event, the puzzle became how should Britain and France respond to this? Well, events started happening more and more quickly. On January 13th, 1935, Hitler won the Saar plebiscite. Remember, the Saar was this region of Germany that was basically put under international control for 10 years and then would be allowed to vote on whether it wanted to be part of France or Germany. It voted overwhelmingly, 90% to 10%, to join Germany. March 7th, Hitler repudiated the Versailles Treaty officially. Up till then, he had been skirting its provisions and violating this one, violating th that one. At this point, he just said, look, we're not abiding by it anymore. He just admitted it flatly. June 18th, there was an Anglo-German naval treaty. It gave Germany the right to 35% of British naval strength and parity in submarines. Now, keep, keep in mind, in 1935, the British Navy was the largest navy in the world by far, much larger than the American Navy, the Japanese Navy, and so on. So 35% doesn't sound that, like that much until you realize, but that was the, of the largest navy in the world. That would have put Germany in the top five, certainly, of naval powers in the world. 
and Hitler also subtly, yeah. and behind the scenes, reached Air Force parity with Britain. Now, I say behind the scenes, Churchill knew very well and kept giving speeches in Parliament saying, look, we've got intelligence that tells us the size of the, Ger you know, Germany was not supposed to be building any Air Force at all. But now they not only have an Air Force, they have one as large as the British Air Force. However, it fell on deaf ears in part. <coughs> well, that summer, Italy prepared for its invasion of Ethiopia. And here you can see, this was British Somalia, here's the Italian Somaliland, which was an Italian possession, and Walwal -Wal was somewhere here on the border. And so Mussolini decided to launch an invasion. Hitler instituted the draft, which he was not supposed to do. <laughs> Britain warned Italy and threatened sanctions. Now, in October, Italy went ahead with the attack. And it was on October 8th that Lansbury, the fellow said, do you must, resigned as head of the Labour Party and was replaced by Attlee. Well, the problem really is what to do about this. Again, imagine that you're a member of parliament in Britain and that Mussolini has said he's going to attack Ethiopia. You've said, don't do it. Look, this border skirmish isn't, skirmish isn't enough to justify that. But he makes it very clear he's going to do it, and then he actually does it. What do you do? I mean, one option is to do nothing, right? One option is to actually support him. Say, we're with you, Mussolini. Another option is to say, we disapprove of this action, but do nothing material about it. A fourth option is to impose sanctions. And I suppose a fifth option would be to actually go to war against Italy, for this aggression and this violation of the Calabrian Pact. Well, I suppose there's a sixth option, which is go in to war in favor of Mussolini. Say, we'll attack Ethiopia too. But nobody considered that. Now, which would you support? Sanctions. All right, sanctions. Now, that's in fact what Stanley Baldwin, who is the Prime Minister, decides upon sanctions. Any other possibilities? Keep in mind the circumstances. This Hitler guy is getting weird. Italy is so far on your side. You've got a treaty with Italy. And they have a, a treaty with Austria and with France. You're, they're an ally, <laughs> right? But they're doing something pretty bad. Yeah. Uh, you know, <laughs> all right, well, you might not know, right? You're, look, you look back to the First World War. And here's why it's not just, I mean, this is a hard puzzle for us now, right? We'd say, wow, I don't know, this is, this is tricky. But think about it from their point of view at the time. Everybody is trying to avoid a replay of World War I. And how did World War I come about? Well, it started off with an assassination in a Balkan country that nobody but the Serbs really cared much about. And then it ballooned and it fell into the, and, and pretty soon all of Europe was at war and it turned out to be an incredibly bloody war. So all of these politicians are thinking, you never know when a seemingly small conflict can ignite a world war. So they're all thinking, do you want to go to war over this? No. Um, they're looking for some way of expressing disapproval. They realize, look, we, we've set up this structure, right? The League of Nations and the keller Briand Pact to keep wars from happening. Here, Italy goes violating it. <coughs> uh, they feel as if they've got to disapprove of that in order to actually keep that structure alive. They aren't willing to actually do anything military because it risks igniting another war. So indeed, they decide upon sanctions. But Churchill mocks this. Churchill says, the prime minister declared that sanctions meant war. Secondly, he was resolved there must be no war. And thirdly, he decided upon sanctions. <laughs> okay, and that actually does rather nicely capture the bizarreness of it. Baldwin <coughs> knew that sanctions basically put Britain on the other side against Italy, alienated Italy. But of course, he didn't want to do it in a very serious way. So he excluded oil and other things that actually might have been of use to um, the Italian war effort. Only things Italy didn't need were actually included in the sanctions. So what does Britain have that Italy might want? <laughs> Yeah, that's, that's a hard question, isn't it? <laughs> Beer? <laughs> Tea? Um, yeah. Wool? I don't know. Whatever it was, it covered things that had no relevance to the war effort at all. Well, that didn't hamper the war effort, of course. In fact, it stimulated the Italian war spirit. The Italians were like, you know, what? The British are against us? Well, we'll show the British. And so it also is more crucially estranged Italy. 
Italy went from being an ally of the French and the British to being an ally of Hitler. Hitler was putting out feelers already, and Hitler, the moment they announced plans to invade Ethiopia, said, yeah, I'm with you, do it, that's the right thing to do. Okay, we can't allow our European powers to be attacked by random countries. No, you've got to respond forcefully. So Hitler made it clear he was on Mussolini's side from the very beginning. Yeah. Wait, so, but didn't he like really upset Mussolini with the assassination? Well, he had earlier, right? When Mussolini met Hitler, he thought he was a complete jerk. But now that Mussolini's in trouble, uh, well, I say in trouble, he's in this delicate international situation. The people he thought were his allies are all denouncing him and imposing sanctions. But Hitler, this guy he thought was a jerk and an enemy, is actually saying, hey, I'm on your side, okay? And so Mussolini starts thinking, maybe I'm on the wrong team here, right? It's the guys on the other team who are actually cheering what I'm doing and supporting me. The people I thought were my teammates, they're actually denouncing me and imposing sanctions on me. Yeah? Didn't Hitler also take Italians to the, like, camps, uh, like Auschwitz? And well, all of that sort of thing happened during the war much later. Oh. But, but for the most part, I mean, only Italian Jews, really. Uh, no, I mean, Italy and Germany were allies throughout the Second World War <laughs> from really this point on. Now, uh, what happened is that Mussolini did become an enemy. And in fact, yeah, I, where, oh, there, it's my picture. Hitler went to visit Mussolini, and you can see them getting along famously now, standing side by side. So it changed the balance of power dramatically. Well, in 1936, <coughs> Hitler remilitarized the Rhine. Remember the Rhineland, this area on the border line, on the border with the Netherlands, Belgium, and France, was to be demilitarized. There were to be no troops there, no military facilities, no bases, or anything of that sort. Hitler violated treaties by sending troops into that region. Now, he admitted if the French had marched into the Rhineland, we would have had to withdraw with our tails between our legs. He knew the German army was not yet capable of fighting the French. The German generals thought he was insane to do this. They basically said, look, this is crazy. We're sending troops into the Rhineland. This is the area right on the border of France. This is going to make the French think we're about to start another world war. Don't do it. They're going to send troops in. We're going to have to withdraw. This is going to be immensely embarrassing. And the generals thought this was just an appalling misjudgment. Hitler said, relax. The French will do nothing. The British will do nothing. And indeed, he turned out to be right. British uh, politicians, French politicians, military leaders just sat there and watched as German troops went over the bridges, went into the Rhineland, um, didn't really raise a peep. Now, that not only suggested to the Germans they could get away with whatever they wanted, but it also strengthened Hitler's hands against his own generals. His generals had unanimously opposed this move. They all said, this is crazy. We're going to lose. This is going to be immensely destructive. And Hitler turned out to be right. The generals, in short, kept thinking, the people in Britain and in France surely are rational. They're going to realize we're much weaker than they are. They can stamp us out easily. They'll do it. Hitler said, no, they won't. And he turned out to be right. This was one of many times he turned out to be right. So the generals, who kept saying, look, this is a bluff. Don't do it. We're, they're going to call their bluff. This is very risky. He said, relax. And he turned out to be correct. Now, what on earth were the British and French thinking? Here was David Lloyd George, a leading British politician who had been one of the people who helped to craft the Treaty of Versailles and actually was in a minority at that time. He kept arguing against these heavy sanctions, heavy war debts being imposed on Germany and so on. Here was his judgment on this. In my judgment, Herr Hitler's greatest crime was not the breach of a treaty because there was provocation. Now, what provocation? What on earth did he have in mind? He wasn't the only person in Britain and France to react this way. They said, well, yes, there was provocation after all. It was really our fault Hitler did this. What is he talking about? Yeah. He's talking about uh, the debt that Germany had to pay back to the Allied countries. Exactly. He's talking about the debt. He's talking about the terms, in short, of the Treaty of Versailles. He's basically saying, look, I admit the Treaty of Versailles was unjust to Germany. And so what is Hitler doing? He's reclaiming things that were unjustly imposed on him at the end of the First World War. So, no, not on him personally, but on Germany. So, go back and look at some of these events that have been taking place. You could say 1934. Well, that's not a good example. But 
All right, Germany gets back to the, the Tsar region. Well, fine, that had been part of Germany. He denounces the Versailles Treaty. Well, it was unjust anyway, so we can understand that. He wants to be able to build up his navy. Well, you know, that, look, Germany was always a strong country. Yeah, it was pretty unjust of us to basically say you couldn't have a military. And then the draft, well, yeah, again, we told him he couldn't have a draft, but hey, we have a draft, so that's okay, really. And then we get up to this point, and he said, well, the Rhineland is part of Germany, so it's really unfair to tell them they can't have troops in that part of Germany, etc. So in short, Lloyd George is, I think, emblematic here of most British politicians at the time and most French politicians who said, we admit the terms of the Treaty of Versailles were unjust. So far, all Hitler is doing is reclaiming what was really justly German, Germany's anyway. And so they don't take any action, partly because they just think, well, yes, I suppose it will be well, kind of unfair. So, so go ahead. Yes, we'll look the other way. That becomes the idea. Now, they might be right about that, right? The Treaty of Versailles was a very harsh treaty. It probably was very unfair to Germany in its terms. On the other hand, when you have people in charge of a country who don't believe in that country's position, who don't actually believe in the justice of their cause, you've got a very dangerous situation. It's the kind of thing I was warning about with respect to the Bloomsbury intellectuals. They train a generation of leaders who no longer believe in their own position. There's a joke, um, a liberal, I think Mark Twain actually said this, a liberal is someone too broad-minded to take his own side in a quarrel. <laughs> But Lloyd George wasn't one of the liberals in, in Britain, really, in our, in our use of liberal. Um, it was really much more general. Most of the conservative party was also on that side. They all basically weren't willing to take their own side in a quarrel with Germany because they thought their own side was unjust. And so you've got a development here where people on one side are really paralyzed. That's why I call this lecture paralysis. Really, they don't believe in their own position, and so they aren't willing to defend it. They allow Hitler to make move after move because they really think, well, he's really just reclaiming what was rightfully Germany's. However, Britain had the good sense to begin constructing radar stations on the coast, knowing that there was now a German Air Force and that they'd better be careful. On May 21st, Hitler declared that Germany had no interest in Austria. This is very bad. When Hitler says he has no interest in you, you're in deep trouble, okay? In July, he signs a pact with the Austrian government, agreeing not to interfere in his internal affairs. Of course, they had already assassinated the chancellor. Then he ordered the Nos Austrian Nazi party to step up its activities. Notice that happens within five days. Well, November, he signs the Rome-Berlin Act, formalizing the, tree, the agreement with Mussolini and the alliance. He also makes a pact with Japan. And so the Axis powers, Japan, Germany and Italy are now lined up. And I've already shown you those pictures, so. Well, the Spanish Civil War, I'm going to just ignore that. <laughs> Leads to some great paintings. Very important. I don't have time. <laughs> I never have time. You know, this is the sixth time I've taught this course, and I never have time to talk about that. Every time, I think this time will be different. And it's never different. Anyway, that stinks, but oh well. 1938. The generals kept telling Hitler, look, you're crazy, don't do this, don't do that. Don't, you're bluffing, blah, 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 blah. Finally, he decides to get rid of a bunch of them. So he fires 18 generals, and he takes control of the army personally. On March 11th, the Anschluss. German troops move into Austria and annex it as part of Germany. The Austrians do not resist. There is no actual military conflict. The tanks simply, and troops simply roll into Austria and take control. Here you see an Austrian woman crying as she is giving what she feels is a forced salute to the German soldiers coming in. That was only the beginning. There was a crisis in Czechoslovakia. By the way, how many of you seen The Sound of Music? <laughs> yeah, that's about the Anschluss, right? The Germans moving into Austria. So that produces great music eventually. <laughs> uh, well, if you like that, Edelweiss and so on. <laughs> now, by the way, my daughter, the music major, just hates The Sound of Music. I like it, but, but she thinks it's stupid. So I, I don't understand that, but anyway. Yes, July and August, the crisis in Czechoslovakia. A significant number of the people in what is today the Czech Republic, uh, in the part of Czechoslovakia that is closest to Germany, 
are ethnically German and speak German. And so Hitler's vision of a greater Germany includes not only Austria, but those parts of Czechoslovakia. So the German-speaking Sudetans in that area called the Sudetenland near Germany demand independence. They basically say, we are German. We deserve to be in control of ourselves. Remember, at the end of the First World War, the principle is self-determination. People should have the right to self-determination. And so they say, look, we have our own ethnic identity. We're being dominated by the Czechs in this country. We demand independence. Well, the Sudeten leader ended up fleeing to Germany. And Chamberlain decided to fly to Munich. Chamberlain was, at, by this point, the British prime minister. And he sees a crisis taking place. Germany is threatening to go to war to seize the Sudetenland if the Czech if Czechoslovakia will not give it up. Um, and so, basically, Chamberlain sees the possibility of another world war resulting from all of this. If Germany attacked Czechoslovakia, he thought there would be a very serious war. Britain and France were allies of Czechoslovakia. And so, he decides he's going to fly to Munich to meet with Hitler. And he meets with him and says, he was a man who could be relied upon when he had given his word. Trusted Hitler completely. <laughs> now, here is the amazing story in the background. Yeah. That very day, that very day, when Chamberlain announced his decision to fly to Munich to meet with Hitler to try to resolve this crisis, the German generals, those who had been dismissed, but also those who remained, said, enough. Okay? Hitler has played one bluff after another. And amazingly, so far, nothing disastrous has happened. But this is too much. Invading Czechoslovakia, that's too great a risk to take. Now, by the way, he, today it's easy to think, wait, the Czech Republic, uh, that doesn't seem like a major world power. But at the time, this region of Czechoslovakia near Germany had Europe's largest armaments factories. The Czech army was one of the largest in Europe. Czech Czechoslovakia was actually a major power, basically equal to France or Britain. And so this was a huge deal. Now, the German generals basically said, attack Czechoslovakia? You've got to be kidding. Their factories are larger than our factories. Their army is larger than our army. We cannot win this fight. And if Britain and France get involved, after all, they're bound by treaties to get involved, we're sunk. So they had made the decision to arrest Hitler that very evening. There was a plan. They, were, they knew where Hitler was. They were going to send in troops to arrest him and imprison him. And they were going to take control of Germany and reconstitute the government. There was, in short, that very night going to be a military coup. But Chamberlain said at about 4 o'clock in the afternoon, I will fly to Munich. The German general said, we better wait and see what happens. A chance to avoid the entire conflict was missed thereby. In fact, all Chamberlain would have had to do is wait one more day. And there would have been no Hitler. Yeah. <laughs> one more day. But instead, he flies to Munich. September 28th through 30 is the Munich conference, where he meets with Hitler. He comes back saying triumphantly, I believe this is peace for our time. OK? Hitler publicly said, this is the last territorial claim I have to make in Europe. Very famous statement, our, my last territorial claim. Privately, he said, our opponents are little worms. <laughs> okay. um, by the way, the transcript of the online version of the course, <laughs> the person heard that is, my opponents are little girls. He did not say little girls, he said little <laughs> worms. Now, this shows you what was at stake. The green areas here within Czechoslovakia are the German-speaking Sudetenland. And what happened is basically the agreement was to take the Sudetenland, which included almost all of the armament factories, and give that to Germany. So Czechoslovakia was to become this little gerrymandered part of what is today the Czech Republic, together with, well, most of Slovakia. It turned out how Hungary quickly moved in and took part of Slovakia. So here we see people actually at this meeting. There's Chamberlain on the left. There's Hitler. There's Mussolini. You see all sorts of people in the background who are leading officials of those governments. Chamberlain comes back announcing that it's peace for our time and says, how horrible, fantastic, incredible it is that we should be digging trenches and trying on gas masks. 
here because of a quarrel in a faraway country between people of whom we know nothing. I am myself a man of peace to the depths of my soul. He tells this to Pearl. Now, a distant, faraway people of whom we know nothing. Czechoslovakia was an ally. There was a treaty between them, okay? Moreover, how far is it from London to Prague? About the same distance as from Austin to Atlanta, or from Atlanta to Washington, D.C. I mean, imagine someone in Georgia saying, Texas? <laughs> well, Texas? <laughs> Washington, D.C.? Those are faraway places of which we know nothing. Okay? <laughs> That's ridiculous. <laughs> and so there's something absolutely absurd about what he says. And there he is at the, getting off the plane saying, it's peace for our time. And you see the news media gathered around. He was hailed as a hero in Britain for this. Now, Churchill thought this was absolutely appalling. But again, Churchill is a voice in the wilderness. Everybody is, yay, peace in our time. Yes. Now, notice, by the way, these negotiations take place between who? Hitler, Mussolini, and Chamberlain. Where are the Czechs? Okay? The people in Czechoslovakia are like, wait, you just gave away most of our country. <laughs> and in fact, the part that actually had all the like factories in it, it had all the military bases in it and so on, and without ever consulting us, it's absolutely astounding. But yes, it was an incredible missed opportunity. But when Hitler again proved to be right, that the British and French and even the Czechs would do nothing, they were absolutely astounded. And so from this point on, Hitler was undisputed master. The generals were going to do whatever he said because they were getting ready to arrest him. They thought, my God, this is leading us to disaster. And then it's like, he's right. Somehow he's like this guru who gets everything right, even though it seems amazing. Churchill was one of the only voices against this who said, we have sustained a total and unmitigated <coughs> defeat. But that was a very unpopular opinion at the time. In any case, this was a crucial turning point. Why? Because Czechoslovakia really was a very powerful country with a very powerful military and also um, huge works, the Skoda works, which were large armament factories. But in general, this was one of the most industrialized regions in the world. So here's why it was a turning point. Britain plus France plus Czechoslovakia, vastly stronger than Germany, even after Hitler's attempts at rearmament. But Germany plus Czechoslovakia, even just those regions of Czechoslovakia, stronger significantly than Britain and France. So this was a chess piece that basically went from one side to the other and completely tipped the balance of power in military terms. The Czech army had 21 divisions, 15 second line divisions. Plus, it required the deployment of 30 German divisions on the border. Take that away, and all of a sudden, those German troops together with all those Czech divisions, can be moved elsewhere. So suddenly, you've got, what is that, 36, 66 divisions that are now freed up to do something else and oppose the British and the French. That is a huge shift in the balance of power. The Skoda Works, as I mentioned, they were the second most important arsenal in Central Europe. They were equal to all of British war production. So moving Czechoslovakia to one side to the other was the equivalent of moving Britain from one side to the other. Okay. This was a hugely powerful nation, and it was just gratuitously given away. Well, at this point, you might guess what happens. It was only a few months later that Hitler would decide he wanted the rest of Czechoslovakia. And once that happened, Chamberlain had a sudden change of heart. We'll see all of that in the future, however, <laughs> but you probably already have a sense that things are not going well. Not only for Britain and France, but for the cause of peace.